the big snow. The week before we were to go home for the holidays, the temperature plunged to a minus 40 degrees. Little children came so cold to school that all of the teachers went to the first grade rooms to help warm them up with buckets of warm water to plunge their feet into. On Saturday, and so on Saturday, a big blizzard blew in. The cold, the wind, the snow, and dry topsoil soil was a combination for misery. That so snow was pink. It had so much dust with it. On, uh, uh, school was out on Tuesday, and I was to go home to Newton for the holidays. I stood at the school windows on Monday and watched the pink tinted pink, pink pink snow blow across the landscape parallel to the ground. We watched it carefully all day Monday and all day Tuesday. Mr. Wheeler, one of the high school teachers, had promised to take us to the train in American Falls at the close of school on Tuesday. Now it began to look through look. Uh, doubtful whether anyone could get out of town. Mr. Reed, the postman, had tried three times all day and had had to come back, and we were all in despair, and I was afraid I was going to have to stay in that little town and not go home for Christmas and see my family. At 4 p.m., Mr. Reed came in to say he was going to try it again. The storm was letting up, and did we want to take a chance with him? Our only accommodation to make that trip to the Rockland was to sit on the floor in the back of the truck with mail bags. And the truck was an early version of a panel truck with soft roll-down curtains on the sides and on the back, and they just fastened down, and they blew in the wind like this. And so the 40-degree below zero wind blew right in on us. There was no heat in that truck. Mr. Minear had loaned me his big Alaska bear coat that someone had made for him, but it didn't cuddle around us. At one point, the truck slid off the road into a 12-foot drift on a curve in the road. With shovels and his helper, Mr. Reed got us back on the road and eventually to the falls. But then it was dark. And with the help of the yard, dim yard lights, we crossed the tracks, heading for the station, and passed right in front of three great big overland locomotives side by side, just in from various points in the northwest, and they were plastered all over with snow. They seemed alive, exhausted, and puffing. We made it. We could have answered so did we. All three of us had to catch different trains. Miss Rouch to go to Nebraska, Miss Buxton to Driggs, Idaho, and I had to wait two more hours for the train to go to Utah. At 4.30 a.m., the conductor called Cash Junction, and he came in for my bags. Little lady, I cannot let you get off here in this place at this hour of the night. It's 40 degrees below zero out there. The station is dark. There's no fire. Do you have someone meeting you? No. But I told him I knew where I was, and I'd be all right. He was still uneasy as he got back into the moving train with his little footstool, and I still wasn't home. And I was all alone on that school platform. I'm not sure how I knew that Hazel and Wilder Barker, that was my cousin that was with us to school, who, were, who had married, and she's very young. And they lived in a little one-room section house south of the depot. And I didn't know, I don't know how I knew that, and I didn't know which one it was. I only knew how, I only know I went to their door and knocked at 4.30 in the morning, and Wilder called out, Who's there? I'm Defonda. I just got off the train. Can I come in till morning? He quickly made a fire, warm fire in a little tiny stove and went back to bed. There was just one room in that place. Well, I sat for three more hours by that fire. 
At 8 o'clock, I went back over to the station, it was open now, and called home. LeVar tromped through knee-deep snow and bitter cold way down to the end of our pasture, about three or four blocks or more away, harnessed the horses, and drove in that bitter weather in the wagon, picked me up in the wagon. I settled in for two weeks of home, holidays, and relaxation. As we were getting ready for the dance the night after New Year's, a telegram came from Rockland. Leave on next train or you may not get in. We hurriedly packed my bags, went to the dance, and LaVar and my cousins from Canada, who spent the holidays with us, Dick and Verda Doddle from up there, took me to the 3 a.m. train. I spent a few hours with that man Pocatello, and by noon I was in a Model T Ford for our six-mile trip to meet Mrs. Reed, Mr. Reed, and the sleigh out in the wind and now driven plains of southern Idaho. Mail bags and school teachers were transferred to the sleigh for the three-hour trip in the blizzard back to Rockland. They were right to send for us. We were isolated by a blizzard, which kept up nearly every day for the next six weeks. When the winds began to abate in the middle of February, people were restless from the hot, long hibernation and organized sleighing parties to western settlements for our feasting and dancing in the little school buildings began. All were able-bodied people, whether married or single, went along. After a couple of these Friday night affairs, a group of men got together to work their way through the last remaining drifts on the highway. On February 21st, the first car went through, from, uh, and the last party was held down the road a piece at a place named, Tro named Roy. While we danced all the old-time dances at the other places, this, this dance was the real thing, an old-time western hoedown complete with fiddle, accordion, blue jeans, red neckerchiefs, boots, and I was about to say spurs. I can't think they would have been, that would have been true. There might have been some entanglements. The local women wore gingham and calico dresses and how they could dance. More square dances than I'd ever seen. I thought I could dance, but they could really dance. And they were very patient and eager to teach the little school mom, and a good time was had by all. In the spring of 1925, I said goodbye to my friends in Rockland. Uncle Dave and Aunt May came out to get me. Virgil Minear thought I should see Fort Hall Indian Reservation and Old ha Fort Hall before I left the area. He said he would pick me up at Aunt May's place on Monday morning and drop me off at Uncle Sam's place in Blackfoot. What he didn't say, that in between, he would have to do a whole day's work. And it, I didn't arrive in Blackfoot until 4.30, and Aunt Rose, who expected me right up there in the morning, was in a state of panic when I caught sight of her on the downtown Blackfoot Street. She had been calling Pocatello, Rothman, and Newton, and I had been enjoying the day. Virgil Manier was a civil engineer for the Reclamation Service, and his work at that time was to measure the flow of all the streams flowing into the Snake River preparatory to building a dam in American Falls. I saw the Copper Dam built and walked the streets of the new town when there was nothing there but cement sidewalks, gutters, and fire hydrants. The town I had seen would soon be underwater, so all movable buildings were moved to the new town, which I did not get to see. I was glad to be back home with the family and prepare for another summer session at the college.